All right, so I'm Gordon from AdStage. Uh, at AdStage, we build a, a multi-network advertising platform. Uh, so basically what that means is that you, know, you can use uh, like basically like AdWords, Bing, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and the future other ad networks all from like one interface. So you don't have to go through all the native interfaces. Um, so you guys may not care that much about that, but maybe your marketing guys so if they do, uh, uh, were you wanting to turn the volume up a little bit, or are you yeah, if you can turn the volume up some, because it's hard for me to like I keep pulling the mic too far away from my face. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, so if your marketing guys are interested, though, you should totally tell them about AdStage, um, and uh, if you let them know, you know that you know if they mention that like you heard about it, Paige, um, Cassandra, you know, Vita. Uh, we'll make sure to get you in, like, because it's still technically sort of in beta, and there's like a little bit of a sign up process. Uh, but we'll make sure you get through. All right, so today I'm here to talk to you about uh, what we're doing there with uh, conversion tracking and how we've used Cassandra to help us with that. Uh, so, what is conversion tracking? Well, as I said, like, you know, our product is a multi network advertising platform, and one of the things you notice when you get all the ad networks next to each other is that not all of them have the same features, right? So some of them have support for things that others don't. And, you know, our customers then, like, see them lined up side to side and they say, oh, how come, uh, you know, like, LinkedIn doesn't do the same thing that AdWords does? So part of what we do is try to fill in some of those gaps. And one of those gaps for some networks is conversion tracking. So um, AdWords is a good example, right? Like AdWords has great conversion tracking, right? Through like uh, analytics. So, you know, you get all kinds of like complicated detailed uh, tracking that you can do there. On the other hand, LinkedIn has nothing built in natively, right? So the only way you can do some kind of conversion tracking is through um, a third party. So since we have lots of folks that use uh, LinkedIn and other networks that don't have native conversion tracking, uh, we wanted to build a thing to do that. Now before I go on, just to make sure everyone's on the same page uh, about what conversion tracking is, because if you don't work in the ad space, maybe you're not that familiar with it. Uh, basically what I'm talking about is just that users click on ads, uh, they visit the advertiser's website, and then while they're on the website, uh, they engage in some activity that the advertiser wants to count as a conversion, all right? So this typically has to do with like, you know, measuring like the success through their sales funnel, right? So this would be things like, oh, did the user take some kind of action to request like a brochure or sign up for an email list or maybe actually purchase a product? Um, so we're collecting that data and then mapping it back to the ads that users clicked on um, so we can provide that information to them. Uh, so, we needed to build a conversion tracker to grab this data, right? So, like, we're going to have out on the user's, web, or, excuse me, the advertiser's websites, some JavaScript. And then that JavaScript will send us some data when, you know, people visit. And it'll send us some data about, like, what ad they last clicked on. And, uh, you know, maybe, like, who they are, like, if we, you know, set a cookie on them, like, to have a unique ID. It'll send us that information, and then we need to process that to determine, um, you know, if there are any conversions. Uh, so, a few design goals in building the system. Uh, we want it to be fast, right? So, like, uh, and I should preface this by saying, like, part of these design goals come out of uh, having actually built systems like this before, right? So, I've built more generalized systems that were intended to, uh, you know, provide, like, deep analytics tracking. And, uh, you know, I knew, in this case, that that's actually not what we wanted. We didn't want something that could do anything and everything. We weren't trying to recreate like Google Analytics or Data Logics. Uh, instead, we were just trying to fill in some gaps that some of the networks had. So, uh, in building it, you know, we wanted it to be fast. Uh, we didn't want to have a situation where we have tons of data and it takes a long time to go through it and process it and figure out what you know, who converted from the data, like we want to be able to get like basically instant results, right? The data comes in, we process it real quick, and within like a couple of seconds, we know, was there a conversion? Um, 
we want it to be uh, simple. So this is not our main line of business, right? This is just part of building out the platform. And eventually we may not even really do conversion tracking, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're, built, we're building like a platform and we have the ability to integrate third-party apps. So eventually we may say, okay, fine, like, you know, we're not going to be in the conversion tracking game. We'll let somebody else do that. And, um, you know, we will either deprecate this or just leave it, you know, as is. Um, and so it should be relatively simple, right? We don't want something like complex to maintain because it's not the thing that we care about the most, right? Um, it should be purpose built. This part comes out of experience. Uh, I knew going into it that like we were building a thing that only needed to handle certain kinds of you know conversion situations, right? We're getting data from a website. We want to um, you know then basically like do some simple things to say like okay after the user clicked on the ad did they take some action on the website and it's all going to be stuff that like can easily be sent from the JavaScript code to our backend right uh, so it was intentionally designed with the idea that like the JavaScript code that runs on the advertiser's website will do a certain amount of lifting to figure out what data to send to us uh, to then actually like you know run our analytics on. Uh, you know, the alternative way to do this is you just send like a huge like stream of data in and then you process it after the fact. But that's a lot more expensive. Um, it gives you more flexibility, but it's, you know, much harder to do. Uh, need to be scalable. Uh, you know, something like this like can easily end up accepting like hundreds of billions or trillions of events a day. Uh, you know, when you start, you know, first you made it like that... It may seem like, I don't know like how to figure out like how much of the stuff there is, but when you start to really think about, okay, you know, there's however many million users on the internet, and you know, the site gets, you know, from each visitor, uh, maybe like 20, 30 actions, you know, come in per day. It very quickly like ramps up and turns into a huge amount of data. Mm -hmm. uh, so it needs the the system needs the ability to scale. And that was part of the reason for choosing Cassandra for the data backend. Right? So we needed the ability to you know, have a database that we were going to build the service on top of that would, be, uh, that would scale you know, with the rest of the app. Uh, and then finally, you know, sort of counter to the other things, uh, we wanted to be flexible. right? So you know, wherever we didn't have to actually nail down something to achieve one of these other goals, we should just let it be free to like, do whatever. All right, so I just give you this as sort of like background on uh, what we're trying to accomplish. And I won't go into all the details here, but this is sort of just a high-level overview of what the architecture of the system ended up looking like. Uh, but we really just care about this one part, about the data stores. Um, and the way we're going to explore these are through the way that we process events when they come in. Okay, so we receive events, and then we want to process them and determine, okay, does this event result in a conversion for our advertiser? Um, and that's where Cassandra comes into play because part of building this process is also taking advantage of features that are in Cassandra to do work for us, right? So we don't actually do all of the heavy lifting in the conversion tracking process. We rely on Cassandra features to actually manage some things for us that would have, without Cassandra, required us to do them ourselves. Uh, and this is no different than perhaps what you would do like in a relational database you know, using the relational database to do the things it's good at, right? We want to use Cassandra to do the things it's good at. So, uh, let's go through pixel processing. So, we did, we have an event stream that's coming in, and it's supplying us with lots of events. So, all of these events are just little, uh, you know, like get requests, right, that have some header data on them about, like, you know, who the user is, what the time, you know, when they clicked on the ad, what the last ad they clicked on was, uh, you know, maybe like how long they've been on the site, how many pages they viewed on the site, things like that. So we get all of that data, and all of that data is interesting, right? And that's all used in determining whether or not a user has matched a particular conversion goal. But uh, that's actually just one small part of the process and doesn't involve Cassandra all that much, right? So we're not going to worry about it. The parts that we do care about, though, are uh, there are two IDs that come in that we're very interested in. 
One is what we call the click ID, and one is what we call the tracker ID. And I'll go into detail of like what these are and how we use them, um, how they interact with Cassandra here in a second. So the first thing we receive is the, or sorry, not receive, but extract out is the tracker ID. Uh, so what this is is a unique identifier that we give to each of our customers. Um, and it allows us to, you know, when we're receiving the data, then like look up in the database, you know, okay, now I know who they are, I'm going to look up their stuff, right? Uh, and the stuff that we want to look up are their conversion goals. So we have this table uh, goal, and it just contains in it, you know, all of the goals for a particular user. Uh, and so if you're not familiar with Cassandra, let me just, you know, quickly walk through sort of how this is structured. Uh, so the red thing on the left, or right, is, yeah, left for you guys, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so the red thing on the left is, uh, is the partition key. So in this case, it, the, the table is partitioned by uh, the tracker ID, right? So that means that like when we store the data in Cassandra, like it's physically written so that like, uh, you know, all of the data on a particular partition is basically stored serially, you know, through the SS tables. Uh, then the clustering ID is the uh, goal ID. So what this allows us to do then is have multiple uh, conversion goals stored for the user in a single row, and then we just pull them all out, right? Um, and so this brings us to the first thing that, you know, cool thing that we're doing with Cassandra that makes things easy for us. We, uh, we're taking advantage of the wide rows to avoid having to do lots of reads. Um, you know, this means we can do a single disk, like in the ideal case, in fact, we don't even typically hit the disk, right? What we in fact do is use row caching, which is another feature of Cassandra, um, you know, to basically keep the entire table in memory. And then um, when we need to pull out, you know, data from it, we just ask for it. It's sitting in RAM. It returns it almost instantaneously, you know, and we're good to go, right? We didn't have to spend, you know, this is perhaps the most boring part of the entire process, right? It's just getting, like, some of the initial data you need. And, you know, this allows it to be super simple. Um, so, uh, now we've, you know, got our conversion goals, right? And we look at the event data, and now we, you know, go through this process of assessing, okay, does this event uh, match a goal, right? Did it, was this conversion goal met? Uh, most of the time, no, right? Most of the data we get doesn't meet a conversion goal. It's just like users doing stuff on the website that's not interesting to anyone ever. Um, but... Occasionally, someone does something we do care about, right? Like one in 10,000 times, someone will do something that is super interesting that we want to like remember that they did and you know, record exactly what, when they did it, who they were, you know, various data about it. So we'll assume we're in that case because if we don't, we have nothing else to talk about. Uh, so we've checked the goal, we've matched, right? And now we want to say, okay, now I want to record that this conversion happened. So the first part of this is we need to figure out, uh, so now we have to get a little bit deeper into like sort of what we're doing uh, with this application, right? So one of the things is that when we report back data, we need to report it back in a particular way. Uh, in online advertising, uh, you have sort of this hierarchical data, stru or hierarchical structure of things that wraps up you know, the various ad units, right? So you have individual ads that are actually like the things that people see online that they can click on. Um, well, I should say it's not even quite like that, right? There's, you know, you see an instance of an ad, right? And the ad is the idea of like that thing that gets shown to you. Um, so there are the ads. Uh, those are typically grouped together in ad groups. Uh, ad groups will share things like targeting, um, maybe budget or bid depending on the ad network. Uh, then ad groups are grouped together in campaigns. Um, campaigns provide like sort of the traditional structure of like how you organize ads, right? Like you put all the ads together to for the, you know, quarter three Pepsi Cola campaign or whatever, right? Um, and they typically have properties like a budget, you know, there's some total amount of money you're willing to spend on this campaign and that's there. 
Um, and then, you know, you have multiple campaigns in your account. And then, depending on who you are, you know, you may have multiple accounts, right? So, we want to be able to roll up the data to all these different levels. Uh, and luckily for us, we know what all these aggregation levels are going into it, right? So, like, when we get in an ad, for example, we know what its ad group is, what its campaign is, who its, what its account is, and that doesn't change ever, right? Like, if you want, if you have a new ad, okay, fine, like, that's a new ad. That's going to be somewhere else. And, like, if you edit an ad in place, okay, you can do that, but you can't move it somewhere else. So it's always going to have the same parentage. So we can take advantage of this to help us do aggregations um, as we process in the data so we don't have to build them later. Uh, so I point this out because the next thing we do is over here with the click data, or this click table, we're getting in this click ID. All, this click ID is somewhat poorly named. I, it's somewhat confusing. I sometimes forget you know, how, what it's supposed to represent myself. But the idea is that the click ID is just a single ID that we, gets placed on the ad, that comes into us, that lets us identify the ad group, right? Uh, and, you know, it's possible to do fancy things with it, like, oh, you could set the same click ID on multiple ads to create, like, pseudo, like, groupings of ads or what. You, know. you can do fancy stuff, but the basic idea is, right, you have a click ID, it represents the ad. So then we want to translate that into, um, you know, some IDs that we actually want to facet on. And the IDs that we want to facet on are exactly the IDs from the hierarchy, right? So, like, we have an ad, and then I say, okay, I'd also like to aggregate the data for this ad on its ad group, its campaign, and its count. So I need to store that information somewhere, right? I have it stored elsewhere in, you know, not in this service, right? Like, another, in another database, another place, like, that information is stored. But we want to ship it over here and store it, you know, simply as possible so that we have it available to us at this time, right? Um, so that's all that we have in Cassandra for it. It doesn't know anything about, like, anything else. It doesn't even understand the relationships between them. All it knows is, oh, I want to aggregate by these facet IDs. Um, so then what it does is, once we have the facet IDs that we want to aggregate, now that we've uh, determined that we've matched some goal, right? So we get, we say, all right, we've matched conversion goal one, two, three, four. So uh, now I'm going to go into uh, my goal member table here and look up, did I already match this event into the goal, right? Or maybe not the event, it might be the user, right? Uh, the idea of this table is to allow our operations to be um, idempotent. So what we want to be able to do is when we get in, you know, this big stream of data, right, in addition to processing it like this, we also write it out to S3 and just keep a big log of, like, all, you know, pixel events that we've ever received. Uh, and this allows us to go back in later and replay. So if there turns out to have been a bug in our code, right, no problem. Uh, you know, we just say, okay, fine, whatever, you know, data we got in since, you know, sometime, like, you know, we go back to some recent snapshot of the database, right, say, all right, get rid of that, uh, that new stuff, we're going to, you know, go back to that point and then rerun everything new, you know, again on top of it. Um, so this, though, makes it easy, you know, so that's part of what we want to be able to do, right? But it's not always the case that, like, we're going to screw it up and they're going to go back and like wipe things out, right? It might instead just be that like, oh, we have some goal now that like an advertiser wants us to uh, run historical data over. And so in that case, you know, our lives are just much easier if we don't have to worry about like, oh, you know, I'm reprocessing this event. Like, did, uh, did I already process it for these other goals or not? I don't know. Like, I don't have to care, right? The whole point of this is to allow me to get away with not having to, to know this thing. So the way that this works is then it stores this member ID here. And this member ID could be anything, right? Most of the time right now, it's, a, it's either like a unique event, event ID that every event gets when it comes in, or it's a um, uh, user ID, right? So we can track things unique to the user. Um, and 
This table works by making everything in here, if you can see, it's all red. So everything in here is part of the partition key. So there's actually nothing, like there are no data columns in this, in this table. This table purely exists for the purpose of accessing a partition key, right? And so we can do two things with it. And this is what allows us to achieve idempotency pretty easily. We can read out of it, and if we get something back, okay, I know I already like processed this event, right? I've already like counted it. So then I just say, fine, forget it, throw it away. The other thing that can happen is, you know, I don't find it, right? And so then I write it into the table and continue on with the process. Um, and so what's really great about this is that, you know, Cassandra gives you the fast lookups with partition keys, you know, it's like basically an order one operation. And part of how that works is that uh, inside Cassandra, you know, it's taking advantage of Bloom filters. So when I actually initially started to build this, uh, I hadn't really thought about the fact that like Cassandra implements Bloom filters as part of its uh, partition key lookup scheme, right? So initially I was trying to think like, I knew that Bloom filters were the right way to solve this problem, right? To get fast lookup, uh, you know, I had a lot of data, I knew I could get like, you know, within like whatever probability, you know, like that I would set, I could get very good results in a short amount of time uh, by using Bloom filters, right? So I didn't have to build like a traditional index, uh, at least as the first pass, right? Like, you know, so I was thinking about this, I was like, all right, how am I gonna implement this? How am I gonna store it? How am I gonna make it efficient? And then, like, one day, I don't know, I was sitting in my office and it dawned on me, like, oh, yeah, that's how partition keys work. So, you know, that problem, like, what was going to be, like, a month of doing stuff was immediately solved just by, uh, you know, taking advantage of Cassandra, right? Just using Cassandra for, purely for the purpose of constructing this Bloom filter, you know, index thing and, uh, and using it for lookups. So... You know, that was another case where we were really able to, uh, and that's why I say that, like, you know, the process really depends on Cassandra, like, to do some of the heavy lifting, because it's, um, you know, it's doing things that, like, without a tool like that, you would probably have to do for yourself in the application code. Um, all right, so the last thing that happens, and this gets us to some more Cassandra features, is that after we've said, yes, okay, this is a new conversion. Now we want to keep track of it, right? I want to store it. So what I'm going to do is come down to this goal conversion table, and I'm going to write out the data here. I'm going to use counters. Um, and there's a couple interesting things going on with this table, right? So one is that we're using the Cassandra counters, right? Uh, here I've just called count. Um, I don't know. It's, count is actually a bad name to use for a column. In Cassandra, just like it is in SQL, because it's a, it's a keyword, so you have to quote it. Uh, but whatever, that's what I did. Uh, and uh, it's, um, you know, the Cassandra counters are really nice because they let you get a way to consistently, like, count something without having to worry about transactions, right? So if you've looked at Cassandra counters at all, if you haven't, you know, I would encourage you to, I guess. There's lots of benefits to be had from them. They, um, they make it really easy to keep track of counts without all the traditional things that you have to worry about in order to maintain consistency. Um, you know, you just tell it like, I'm going to increment by X amount or decrement by you know, Y amount. And that information gets written into the commit log and uh, you know, can then later be like replayed if there are consistency issues. Uh, you know, it's, it's really clever. Uh, it does have some drawbacks in older ver like so if you're using Cassandra 2.0, uh, which I assume most people are, you have to be a little bit careful about it. Um, they do have, uh, it, it's not, I guess it's in the documentation, but I don't know, I know who reads the documentation. The uh, counters force all level consistency on your reads and writes, so <laughs> if you're running operations that uh, that use counters, and then you try to do maintenance operations on your Cassandra database at the same time, that's really bad. Um, you know, you will not be, like if you try to take down nodes or add nodes, uh, it just makes a huge mess, right? Like, you'll, you'll basically never, like nothing can happen 
while that's going on, right? So your only choice is really to just shut down that process uh, that's, you know, that's modifying the counters uh, or reading from them um, while you do Cassandra operations. But good news is once you go to 2.1, that's gone, right? They've changed the way the counters work. Excuse me. <clears throat> they, uh, they go into the commit log in a different format, and it's, uh, it's not an issue anymore. Um, so that's just something to watch out for, though, if you're on 2.0. All right, so enough about counters, though. So, you know, so we're using those to just keep track of how many conversions happen, right? And then we're grouping them together in, uh, you know, buckets by time series, or time series, by time scale, right? So what we want to store in this table is a time series of data, and we're going to break it up into buckets because we don't actually need full resolution of this data for our customers, right? We, in fact, only need one hour resolution. And we don't even really need one hour resolution. We actually only need one day resolution. The only reason we store it at one hour resolution is so we can correct for our customers' time zones, right? So that we can, you know, realign the data based on what their time zone is. Uh, and that's important because most ad networks uh, let the, like the, the user's account on the ad network has a time zone associated with it. And so if they have scheduling stuff set up um, based on, you know, what day something was, was done or how much money to spend per day, uh, time zone turns out to be pretty important, right? So they actually care a lot about, uh, you know, what they consider a day for their ads. Um, so we need to be able to adjust the data to reflect that, right? We can't get away with just saying, like, okay, we're just going to do UTC days and everybody will be happy with that. Uh, so we have to do that. Now we do we just do it to the hour, but if you if you're curious about doing a time zone uh, parting to the hour level, do it correctly. It turns out you actually have to do it to the 15 minute level. So that's just a little bonus there. There are time zones that are 45 minutes off uh, from like the hour. So uh, you you would have to do 15 minutes to get it perfect for every time zone. But basically. There's like two time zones where that happens, and I, we don't have any customers there, so, okay. And there are half hour time zones, but uh, it turns out that like most people in half hour time zone, half hour off time zones are already used to this anyway, right? Like they already deal with this where people just didn't bother to support them. So until someone complains loudly enough, it's good for now, right? Um, okay, so. We have, you know, this state, so it's clustered by the, by the timestamp. And so since now we have a time series of data, when you have this in Cassandra and you've clustered by either a time UUID or timestamp column, uh, what happens is that you can now do very efficient range queries across your rows, right? So we are able to take advantage of that because this is exactly the table that we're going to read the data out of to report data back to our users in the user interface. So now when they ask for data between, you know, let's say, uh, you know, November 1st and November 15th, it's very easy for me to go in, I request this row, Cassandra makes it very fast to just like pull out just the chunks of data that actually are part of that, and then we can, you know, do any additional aggregations in memory real quick that we need to do. Um, now the other thing to note is that like, this does import, because we need this to be the clustering column, right, so we can do those kind of range queries, this does force everything else that you, is used in uniquely identifying this counter to be in the partition. So we are forced to store the goal ID and the facet ID. Obviously, one of these would have to be stored here, but like we can't get away with storing, say, all of the, uh, like all of the data for a particular goal in a single row, right? Because if we were to do that, we would have to move the facet ID into the clustering column part, and then we would lose the ability to do the range queries efficiently. So, you know, we're sort of, you know, you have to make trade-offs like that, like that sometimes in order to take advantage of particular features. Uh, so, oh yeah, so, we're cool for counters. All right, so, uh, I spent a lot of time talking about, like, how this thing works and the details and the guts of it. How's it working for in production? It's pretty good. Um, I'm not allowed to show you any numbers, 
but it's up and to the right. I think that's, you know, that's, that's what's important, right? Um, yeah, so it's doing pretty well. Like, we've, uh, you know, had to scale it a few times. Not really had any problems. Like, you know, we've had big customers come on. They suddenly start sending us a flood of data. Um, other parts of the system that I haven't shown here, like, take care of, like, queuing up the data when it comes in and, like, you know, putting it somewhere so that way it can, uh, we can process it asynchronously. So basically, like, our scaling story for it has just been like, oh, I get in in the morning and I see that the queue is backed up, and then I spin up like one or two more workers, and that's it. You know, we're done. Uh, and it puts very little load on Cassandra actually. So uh, the, the various operations we're doing are very efficient. So like, we're th this particular application like results in almost no load on the system. Right? It doesn't store very much data. It uh, its operations are all pretty quick. Uh, it doesn't do any deletes. That's fantastic. Um, so it's really, uh, you know, Cassandra is not even close to being the bottleneck, right? Um, so that's really good. Uh, and that's all possible, not just, and of course, you know, that's possible not just because of uh, Cassandra, but also because of, you know, building the app on top of it with scalability in mind, right? So uh, that's just always one thing I think to tell people to keep in mind is that like Cassandra will not magically fix your problems, right? Like uh, you have to build everything else with the expectation that it's going to be uh, scalable. Cassandra just gives you a way like in the back end for the uh, uh, you know for the data store to be scalable. All right, so uh, almost the last slide. I come to these meetups every month, and uh, I know one question that is inevitably asked. Uh, if if you do not put it in your slides, someone will ask you. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about our operations. Uh, so our production cluster, so we just have one large uh, production cluster right now. It is uh, constructed out of nine I24X larges. Uh, that's actually going to change soon. It's soon going to be constructed out of 18 I22X larges. Uh, but if you're not familiar with the I24X large, those are sort of its stats. It's a an AWS instance type. Uh, the I2, if you're going to use AWS, I would highly recommend you're trying to decide what kind of instance type should I use. Uh, you can't really do any better than the I2. Uh, that series really provides the best like performance balance for you uh, on AWS. Like the only way it really makes sense to use something else is if you don't have, if you have a very atypical uh, Cassandra use case. Um, like you are like if you were extremely, extremely write heavy and you never read anything, then maybe it would make sense to go with smaller things that like would spread out the write, you know, workload more. But for the most part, the I2 is, you know, is a great series for it. Uh, so right now we're running 4x larges, but we're actually going to change to 2x larges. Uh, the only reason we ever ran 4x larges, they're not actually recommended by data stacks or anyone. Uh, they just have like way more memory than you really need. So what happens is that just acts as like bonus, uh, you know, page cache for the operating system. But it's actually in some ways bad, right? Like you're somewhat inefficiently using the resources because your write throughput is lower because you have fewer nodes for the same number of resources, right? So in a lot of ways, it's better to go to the 2x larges to get that better balance. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. Uh, the only reason it was like this is because I used to manage this myself, right? So uh, we used to, you know, do the operations for the Cassandra cluster all in-house because there was no other option, right? Uh, and now I'll we'll, we'll plug our friends at InstaCluster. Uh, they're a company out of Australia. If you're at the Cassandra Summit, they were there and you may have met them and heard them talk about, like, some of the interesting things they're doing to do, like, multi-data center um, deployments of Cassandra. Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, they're great. Basically, like, now I don't have to worry about that anymore. I just... I say, fine, you know, I, uh, Ben is their CTO, you know, if there's some problem, I just call up Ben and just say, okay, you do it. I, wanna, I don't want to know. Um, so that's nice, right? I can just focus on the application layer and let someone else focus on the, uh, the infrastructure layer. So that's very nice, and that's like a really new thing, right? So they're still only like, they're pretty fresh. Uh, they're still a little rough around the edges, I guess, but uh, it's definitely worthwhile, I think. 
uh, for myself at least, I you know I don't have uh, you know being at, like when you're working a startup, you don't have like lots of extra resources typically to spend on operations. So it's great to be able to spend more money on developing your core product and just let someone else deal with operations, uh, which is exactly what we've done. Like this was actually the only piece of operation, like internal like operations stuff that we had to deal with. Like this is the only infrastructure we had to manage. And uh, now that's outside, so like now we manage more infrastructure directly. So, you know, that's great for us. Uh, and of course, I should mention data stacks. Uh, we use the data stacks enterprise edition. Uh, InstaCluster will run DSE for you if you have a license. Uh, and being a startup, we actually don't even pay for data stacks. Uh, you know, we're part of like the startup program. So there's um, like if you're, I forget what the requirements are. I'm sure. I mean, I can tell you. Yep. Yeah. So there you go. A little plug for data stacks. Uh, and then if you're using them, you can use that on Insta Cluster. Um, so yeah. So you know, you don't have to worry about like you go to a hosted solution, you don't have access to like your fancy you know data stacks uh, implementation that you have access to. Uh, okay. So that's enough uh, pitching for. For other people, uh, I was mentioning ad stage again. Uh, you know we're pretty great. Uh, you know you should tell tell your marketing folks about us. Uh, yeah, I'm sure they'd be very happy to to take advantage of us. And like I said, you know, uh, make sure you know if they are interested, you know, and they reach out to us, make sure that they just like send an email that says something like, "Oh, we're at the," uh, you know, we saw Gordon talk at the Cassandra meetup, and you know. He said we could be let in like immediately, and we'll just let them into the trial right away. Um, so if you're interested in us, you can check us out at uh, adstage.io. And you know, I'm Gordon, and you can follow me on Twitter or look at my blog. Uh, and that's it. So questions?